Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 130. Pluses, Contracts, and the Final Frontier. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my dedicated, talented, and somewhat fatigued co-host, Michelle Whalen. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. At least I didn't describe you as energetic today. <laughs> right, because then I would have been like, yeah, no. <laughs> so besides being tired, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm fan-freaking-tastic. So glad to hear that. Yeah, well, I, I can pretend, right? Sure, sure. We can fake it till we make it. There you go. <laughs> uh, anything to talk about before we get to what we're talking about? No. Okay. Quiet, well, quiet makes, week and makes it easy. Thanksgiving is next week, so I'm guessing <clears throat> we'll probably we will be be broadcasting around the clock, twenty four seven for the holiday. No, we're not. Yeah, really. I didn't think so. Okay. Are we doing a podcast <laughs> next week? I don't know. I guess we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Depends on how much turkey we have. Yeah. A couple of days off as well. Mm, true. We could. Maybe. Maybe we'll do something special. Or not. Wink, wink. Or, or maybe, maybe not. Maybe we'll just have screaming goats. Don't like. make me. <laughs> do make me get my screaming goat. Because I can. Anyway. Anyway. Today in our Disney Detective, the big reveals from Disney Plus Day. And the boys troll Disney Plus Day with their own Vault Plus updates, which was actually kind of clever. Mm -hmm. In our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Kathleen Kennedy has officially re-opted her Lucasfilm contract. And Patty Jenkins and Ryan Johnson's Star Wars projects may have been shelled for something other than scheduling. <gasps> Did they finally realize that Ryan Johnson can't make a Star Wars movie? Oh, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> then for our entertainment news... Action news actor, uh, anchor. He's not an actor. No. He's an anchor. Right. Action news anchor Jim Gardner dials back his schedule and prepares for retirement, which was not really an entertainment thing, but it was a story that kind of hit close to home for me because I grew up watching right. it's Jim Gardner. Right. It's a local story for, yeah. for those of us in this area. Yeah. He deserves a, a, a little shout out. Sure. Not that he's ever going to watch the podcast, but still. it's We could tag him. We, we certainly could. <laughs> Uh, also in entertainment news, Paramount is building a Star Trek theme park in China. <laughs> One that we'll never get to. <laughs> so there's another interesting thing that I'll talk about when we get to that too, that's making certain Star Trek fans very angry. Oh, okay. Paramount right now. Oh, okay. Then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and a few afterthoughts. Not a whole lot left until, uh, the new year, I think, but, uh, some interesting ones. Right. Before we do that, though, I would uh, invite our listening audience and our viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions of all the network's podcasts are listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Buzzsprout, Podbean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I have Stitcher on there twice, don't I? Yep. You it's say really, that. It's, and you say that every time, too. It is that good that you subscri should subscribe <laughs> to us on Stitcher. Um, we also <laughs> would invite you to reach out to us. Give us your feedback. Tell us when I have something, you know, doubled up on my screen here and right. where my mistakes are. Do some proofreading for us. Uh, yeah. Yes, please do. <laughs> Maybe um, we need an editor. <laughs> you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things. On Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. 
on Instagram. Do we still post on Instagram? It's been a while. Yeah, we're 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 negligently on Instagram at Instagram.com. I was going to say, I think I things. post more on Instagram than I do on Facebook. So. Well, Facebook, I think it automatically posts. So no, it, it doesn't. doesn't. Okay. No, I have well. to actually physically do that. Okay, well, then don't look for us on those. <laughs> we're always on Twitter, though. We're always on Twitter. Always on Twitter. Well, you can go to those and you'll find a link to everything else. But, That's true. Yeah. Or you could just go to our official website. Which is really where you should probably just go. At insightsintothings.com. <laughs> Are we ready to get start it oh sure let's All do right. this let's start go for disney detective so disney plus is going big on marvel so last friday the streaming service announced several new animated projects and confirmed others that had been rumored to be in development Disney Plus also showed off the first footage for upcoming live action shows Moon Knight, She-Hawk, and Ms. Marvel, as well as the Marvel Studios special that debuted on the service to celebrate Disney Plus's second anniversary. So among the newly announced projects are X-Men 97, Spider-Man Freshman Year, and Marvel Zombies. So X-Men 97, which is due out in 2023, continues the story of the beloved 1990s animated X-Men series, which ran from 1992 to 1997 and was praised for its sophisticated, serialized storytelling that has been cited as an inspiration by such, uh, by such creators as Loki director Kate Heron. Bo DeMeo, known for his work on The Witcher, is going to be the head writer. Spider-Man Freshman Year is an animated show exploring Peter Parker on his way to becoming the MCU's Spider-Man. It's described as celebrating the early comic roots of the character. Jeff Trammell will serve as the head writer. Tom Holland, who first played Peter Parker in Captain America Civil War, which was established to be a sophomore in Spider-Man Homecoming, which occurred two months later. So it's likely that the series will kind of take place before Civil War. And then Marvel Zombies, uh, which was from director Brian Andrews, reimagines the Marvel Universe as a new generation of heroes fights the zombie plague. What If recently explored the concept of Marvel, Marvel Zombies, which the Walking Dead creator Robert Kirkman tackled in the pages of the comics 15 years ago. Zeb Wells will serve as executive producer and head writer. Additionally, we found out that Marvel had renewed What If for season two, with Andrews directing and A.C. Bradley returning as head writer. The studio also confirmed another a number of series and specials which were already known to be in the works, including the Hawkeye spinoff Echo, which will star uh, Aqua Cox as Maya Lopez. Uh, Marvel also revealed that the Catherine Hahn WandaVision spinoff is titled uh, Agatha House of Harkness. In addition to the news of these upcoming shows, Marvel unveiled the first footage of Moon Knight, which stars Oscar, Oz Oscar Isaac, Woo! Uh, She-Hulk, which is starring Tatiana uh, Milana, and Ms. Marvel, headlining by newcomer Amon Villani. Marvel's next series, Hawkeye, will debut November 24th. So Disney Plus Day came two days after Disney earnings revealed sluggish growth for the streaming service. But Marvel closed out Disney Plus Day with the types of reveals that fans had been hoping for regarding Star Wars but did not receive. While Lucasfilm has a number of series coming up, such as the Diego, Luno's, Diego Luna's Andor, no footage was actually shown. However, Obi-Wan Kenobi, which is starring Ewan McGregor, uh, had just some, you know, uh, uh, were just featured in a little bit of a sizzle reel with director Deborah Show, and basically just included concept art. So, yeah, they went pretty heavy on Marvel with yeah. uh, Disney Plus Day, but we kind of figured that, you know, we, we knew the number right. were we, coming. Right, right. 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 There wasn't anything that was kind of a surprise, but it was nice to get the first looks yeah. at a lot of the different things. 
but like you said, definitely have heavy on the Marvel, and maybe because of the they didn't tell as much with the Star Wars because we've been they've been talking about the Star Wars for yeah. a lot of it, I guess. <clears throat> um, but it it was definitely you know well, and I think interesting a, to hear and say some of that Star Wars is getting ready to drop right now too, where some right. of the Marvel stuff is a little bit further right. out. Most of the stuff is you know some of it's for twenty twenty two, some of it's not even until twenty twenty three. So who knows with everything else that's going on what else will get, you know, pushed out or what got pushed out to to make room for these things. But it's nice to see, you know, it's a, a nice collection of different things kind of sprinkled What's throughout. interesting is this comes a day or two after Disney had announced that their growth for Disney mm-hmm. Plus subscribers have has been rather sluggish. Right. So I, I, I don't know if this is one of these things where <clears throat> they're, they're kind of taking a shotgun approach of, okay, Here's all the stuff that's coming out. We've got more. We know you've liked these shows here. Right. So we're getting spinoffs of everything, mm-hmm. which is exactly what they did last year with The Mandalorian. Right. right. You went, They wound up announcing all these spinoffs for Star Wars. Mm-hmm. It didn't bring the numbers in that they wanted. So now they're doing basically the same thing with Marvel. Right. Is that going to bring the numbers for them? And that's the thing, too, is that you have the, you know, you, you have – a couple of different types of subscribers. You have the person that I'll just pay the full year, whatever, you know, they, right. they pay the lump sum and they do it. Or you have the person who, you know what? I'm just going to wait till the series drops and then I'll just get it for two months and, and watch binge everything, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing too, is what Disney does is they don't necessarily drop a whole season. Right. They don't Netflix it. They, you know, so you have to wait a month or two months for everything, you know, if that's the way you, you want to do it. Yeah. So y- those are the people that they have to schedule their time well, the other thing, to, the to make other, sure they cancel it, you know, in enough time. I the guess. other thing to keep in mind is they've tried the scattershot approach mm-hmm. in the movies with Star Wars. True. And didn't get buy-in. Where they do get buy-in from the Marvel side. Right. So maybe having all these Marvel shows will be a key. And you also have to take a step back and realize Disney already, Marvel already went through and had a whole bunch of series out in in the television Mm -hmm. with the Netflix series. True, true. And they were insanely popular there. Right. Now, the fact that they didn't bring any of those over to Disney Plus is kind of puzzling. It makes you kind of stop and scratch your head for a bit there. But I think they already have a formula right now that's successful with the Marvel, mm-hmm. you know, series. That well, might work I, I know there better. was some article or I remember seeing some headline. I don't remember if I actually read the article, but it was kind of talking about is Disney Plus going to move towards more non-family. Right. And that's where you could bring all of those because you know the majority of those they were not (laughs) they were not family so that's you know so how do you bring those unless you have so they they're probably trying to figure out the parental controls and and everything that was what hulu was supposed to be right they were supposed to put all that stuff on hulu and they never really did right then they talked about having the the sectioned off area on Disney Plus with the, the parental control. Right, right. They haven't done that yet either. So it, it's it, given the direction that Disney's going at mm-hmm. this point in time, it almost makes me wonder is, okay, are they going to come out with another network you have to subscribe to to get that kind of content? Right, yeah. Who knows? So. But anyway, Disney Plus Day was not marked just by Disney. It was also marked by Vault from the <laughs> a- Amazon show, right? Yeah, this was kind of funny. So while Disney was rolling out the virtual red carpet for Disney Plus Day, the boys celebrated Vault Plus Day and the plusness of it all. So Friday's Disney Plus Day came with first looks and trailers and announcements on various movies and shows across the Disney brand, but it also brought out the maniacs behind the boys for their own version of Disney Plus Day. Inside the superhero-centric world of Amazon Prime's video, uh, Amazon Prime's videos, Emmy-nominated satire. Vought is the big corporation on the block with Vought-themed theme parks, cinematic universe of movies that they actually call the VCU, 
um, and a Fox News parroting news network. So in response to Disney Plus Day, Amazon announced Vought Plus Day. And Vought rolled out its premier soups from the seven, including Homelander, Starlight, A-Train, Black Noir, uh, Queen Maeve, to showcase all of the entertainment coming to the fictionalized Vought Plus streaming platform, each of them ending their presentations by emphasizing the plus of it all. So with Vought Plus, you have the power to control the greatest content in the world, Homelander says in a promo. There are movies and shows from Vought Studios, titles like Terminal Beauty, starring Pop Claw, the Invisible Force movies, starring Translucent, and the Mesmerizer series, starring Mesmer. Also, there's fashion, news, sports, and pop culture coverage. Programs for women that tell the stories we want to see, says Starlight and Maeve as they riff on corporations promising diverse and inverse storytelling. From Irvin Beats to City Streets, shows that per- put diverse voices front and center, says A-Train. Vought Plus was previously discussed on 7 on 7, which the boys' in-world news segments that have been released online every month to prep viewers for Season 3. So now all that's left is for an Amazon marketing team to launch a working Disney, uh, not Disney Plus, but Vought Plus website. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was kind of funny. And I'm, I'm reading over the article and going down that list of names. I'm thinking, okay, he's dead and he's dead and he had his head blown off. <laughs> <Right? laughs> they brought back all the dead characters. Yeah. Thinking, wow, okay, I guess they got stock footage. Okay, <laughs> sure, that works. That works. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of what we expect from, from oh, absolutely the creators of that show. It's yeah. a very, very well done, very, very tongue in cheek mm-hmm. look at superheroes. We're very interested in, in when that one comes back. Yeah, that'll that's definitely on the watch list. Uh, so I think that was all we had for our Disney Plus. Disney Plus, right? <laughs> Disney detectives. Disney detectives. Plus in it. That's right. A lot of pluses here. Uh, that was it for uh, Disney Detective. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. Plus in it. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars Trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. This week on our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy... Kathleen Kennedy has re-upped her Lucasfilm contract for three more years. StarWarsNewsNet.com tells us Matthew Baloney's latest op-ed for Puck Newsletter uh, casually revealed that Kathleen Kennedy would be extending her tenure at Lucasfilm for another three years. Quote, Kennedy has a lot of good things happening at Lucasfilm, and I'm told she recently re-upped her deal for another three years. This matches her latest re-up back in 2018, which extended her contract to 2021. <laughs> I had to put my over shoulder on. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Sorry, I got distracted there. <laughs> um, blah, 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 I lost my spot. Uh, the current deal will now keep Kathleen Kennedy in charge until at least 2024, at which point she'll have to weigh out her options once again. While the theatrical side of the Star Wars franchise has run into setbacks, including a recent decision to delay production on Rogue Squadron to allow the script to receive the necessary amount of polish, 
Things are moving relatively smoothly on Indiana Jones and the many television series that Lucasfilm are developing for streaming. This move to re-up her contract is relatively unsurprising in the grand scheme of things. Kennedy spearheaded the revival of a film franchise that has averaged over a billion dollars per movie since she became the head of the company. She's also given Disney one of their biggest streaming hits in The Mandalorian, which is one of the most popular originals on Disney Plus that carried the service in its first year. It was also fairly obvious that she'd stick around after 2021, considering she's been involved with every Indiana Jones movie, and the fifth and final one is currently filming and won't be released until 2023. Disney CEO Bob Chopik, not that Bob, the other Bob, (laughs) previously stated that Kennedy will continue to be involved with the company for years to come, and it's unlikely that she will be removed from her position or encouraged to leave with this in mind. So they're not going to invite her not to work there anymore. That's nice. As of yesterday, Lucasfilm has confirmed the validity of the contract extension, as has Kennedy's husband, movie executive Frank Marshall, who retweeted a tweet about the news of her extension. Kennedy's slate of movies include A Droid Story, which is a Disney Plus film, Rogue Squadron, several untitled Star Wars films that are being developed by Taika Waititi and others, the fifth Indiana Jones film, and Children of Blood and Bone. And her slate of shows for Disney Plus include the Star Wars series and miniseries The Mandalorian, The Bad Batch, The Book of Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Andor, Ahsoka, The Acolyte, Lando, and Rangers of the New Republic, currently not in active development, along with a television sequel to the cult classic fantasy film Willow. Now, we give her a lot of credit for all this stuff Mm -hmm. here, and I'm really curious because we don't hear a lot of news about what her involvement is on everything. Right. So I'm curious just how hands-on she is with all these projects because that's a lot of projects. Right. Is it more like she's just kind of the overseer of it? Right. And then you, know, you, you and then she just kind of signs off on things cuz that again that that's a lot and that's a lot you know it's only a 3 year contract that's more than 3 years worth of exactly. stuff right there so Exactly you're talking about multiple seasons of shows you're talking about multiple movies and and I can almost believe that she is hands on given the other reports of the creative differences and the micromanaging True. that happens. Mm-hmm. So I can totally see her being that hands-on. But, you know, I mean, I, I can only look at what Star Wars has been in the past, and they've never had this many projects burning right. at one time. Right. Um, and even with Filoni and, and Favreau, they had to kind of split things up. They couldn't both be working on The Mandalorian full-time with mm-hmm. Bad Batch out and Book of Boba and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. Even Filoni had to step back into a, a different role now. So I, I don't right. know. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm okay with her. Right. You getting, don't. I, I don't want to see her go. Right. But I'm just curious how valuable she is to the company that they're making such a big deal about it. Mm. Or maybe there's, you know. Other people that are kind of underneath her. Right. You know, like that, if she goes, is she taking an entire staff with her? Right. Or is it where she's training to get people ready for, you know what? I've been doing this a while now. I yeah. want to, you know, yeah, step like, back. Is there an exit strategy? Is that something that a Filoni would move into? Or do they have other people lined up for it? Right, right. I'm curious if if it's if the three-year contract is really a transitionary period or not. Could be. Like, hey, in this three years, we're going to start moving things, yeah. you know, yeah. from you to you. So, mm-hmm. well, time will tell. Yeah. Time will tell. Anyway, um, they also mentioned in that article about the um, Patty Jenkins uh, Rogue Squadron um, film that has been shelved that we talked about last week. Mm-hmm. So they're also speculating that there's reports that Patty Jenkins and Ryan Johnson Star Wars projects were shelved because of creative differences. Mm. This comes from IGN. Following the news that Patty Jenkins Star Wars movie has been delayed indefinitely, reports have surfaced suggesting that the movie was the move was made due to creative differences between the director and Lucasfilm executives. 
the former Hollywood reporter and editor, uh, Matthew Baloney, once again reports that the issues between Jenkins and the studio caused the film to be taken off Lucasfilm's production schedule. Specifically, B- Baloney reports that the issues have, invol- have revolved around the film script, stating that Jenkins and studio executives couldn't agree on how to move forward. Baloney states that this is a laughably, quote, laughably recurring problem, unquote, at Lucasfilm. According to the article, a number of agents have previously reported that top filmmakers are often keen to sign on for a movie with the franchise, but find themselves hampered by issues of micromanagement and plot point by committee processes. Baloney cites that similar experiences were held by Game of Thrones showrunners David uh, Benioff and and Dan Weiss, who, quote, bailed on creating a Star Wars trilogy, as well as Ryan Johnson's own trilogy having been shelved, thankfully. (laughs) Jenkins' Star Wars film was originally announced in December of 2020. Disney revealed at the time that the film would be called Star Wars Rogue Squadron and that it would be the first title in the franchise to feature a female director. While the title shares its name with a franchise-based video game, Disney confirmed shortly afterward that Rogue Squadron would not be an adaptation and instead would feature its own original story. While little else is known about the film's plot, the future of the film now appears to be far from certain. If production does resume again in the future, it's likely that fans won't see anything from the film for some time yet. Now, with that in mind, it does open the possibility up to some of these other projects taking on more limelight and getting more resources. True, true. Uh, We reported a few weeks back that uh, Taika Waititi was actually out doing location scouting for his movie. Mm -hmm. So we may see that move forward. Uh, we already know that principal photography for many of the shows is already done for right. um, Andor, Obi Wan, and a few others. So there's not a lot of resources tied up with those at this mm-hmm. point. Um, we uh, reported that Mandalorian started filming a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. so we know that one's under production. So I'm curious how shelving these other projects is going to affect this. Shotgun effect of projects again. Right. Um, they've got a lot of irons in the fire right now. And even, you know, operating as Lucasfilm and Disney, there's a finite amount of resources. Right, right. Uh, I was reading an article today uh, actually about the the uh, shooting, unfortunate shooting accident on the Rust set. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the industry insiders had talked about the fact that – Movie sets are are becoming progressively more unsafe because the amount of professionals to do all the filming mm-hmm. is being stretched thin with all these new sources um, of all these new studios that are demanding content for streaming platforms. Okay. Um, and it, they made, kind of made an interesting point about the fact that we're we're producing more content than ever, mm-hmm. and as a result, they're cutting corners on on a number of these things now, yeah. which was a testament to the unfortunate accident right. on that set. But it also speaks to all these projects that mm-hmm. Disney has. I mean, we we reported a few months back about them creating uh, two more versions of the volume, the virtual set for them right, to shoot right in, to be able to do it in, right. in different parts of the mm-hmm. world to do it. so. You know, they're ramping up their production itself, but you're adding so many new projects Mm -hmm. that several have already been shelved. Right. And that's the other thing, too, is kind of going with the oversaturation of things. You know, you have to, you know, think back to when, you know, a show would come out September, October, and it would run for a couple of months, and then they'd go on hiatus for, you know, a couple of months, and then... They'd come back and, you know, they'd finish up in May. And then you didn't see the show again until, you know, the following year. Yeah. You know, and then you, you know, if you talk about like British television, you know, they'll do a a season and then it's like three years before the next season, you know, comes up. But now we've gotten so accustomed to this. Okay, when's the next one? When's the next one? And 
because there's so many, like you think about like shows like Stranger Things, okay? And how long it's been since the last season of Stranger Things. It's been like two years, almost three years. And like the next season's not even coming out until next year, yeah. you know? And then you get other things that, um, you know, like the Karate Kid that they, co- Cobra Kai, it comes out a little bit more, you know, frequently. And, it, it, and it's kind of like, unless you put it on a calendar and really see how it is and there's just so much out there because again you have all these different yeah. streaming services where back in the day you had three networks and that was it and yeah. you didn't get anything else unless you went to a movie and even yeah, you, then you still didn't have you had your, your as many movies out three months four months of first run and then you went in the in the reruns and all the right. networks went in the reruns right and you, you and then you had you know your your fox or your you know your uh syndicated right. you know station and that's where you saw your you know reruns of of things and that was it now every station you know i i i I've lost track of how many different streaming services there are now. And obviously there are the ones that have the more reality base. So, you know, but every, you know, all these other ones like Paramount has a plethora of stuff and you have, you know, discovering, you have Disney plus and, uh, you know, Amazon and Netflix and all of these, and they all have so much. So, you know, the, it's like, okay, we're going to put this now. We're not going to do right. it now because we can't. But it totally makes sense, you know, along with all of the supply chain yeah. you issues. Have to feed this bee. You have to feed this content consuming bees. Right. And there's only so much content that you can churn out because there's only so many people that you can right. hire to, to, to do, do full production. To productions. do the jobs, yeah. I mean, you look at some of the stuff they're producing on Disney Plus and you're looking at producing, you know, Half of a feature film mm-hmm. for every episode right. that you're doing, right? Like that's a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, you do a you do an episode of The Mandalorian, two episodes, and you got a feature film, right? And you figure there's usually eight episodes per season, yeah. so that's you know four movies that you just made, yeah, for that, yeah. So I, I think they need to be a little bit more picky and choosy about what they're releasing here. I think they're. This idea of, okay, we're going to announce 15 shows and maybe four of them make it the press. Right. You know, that's the practical mm-hmm. approach to it. But when you announce 15 of them and you get everybody's hopes up, you're going right. to have very Like, oh, I want to see. Right, exactly. It's better off to just you not know. say anything until it's actually in production. Right, right. And it's almost like, so do they announce these things to see what kind of reaction they get, to see which direction they should be going in? Did... You know, we didn't do Rangers of the Republic. Was it because we got rid of, um, I can't remember her name now. Cara? Cara Dune, yeah. Is, was that it? Or was it because we didn't really get the reception to that title that we were hoping to get? Right. Like, are you using your audience as a focus group? Maybe. <laughs> Even though there should already be uh, yeah. a focus group. So, I don't know. It, some of this doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. But the fact that you're still getting creative differences with people like Patty Jenkins is kind of terrifying at this point. Right. Because again, it's not like she hasn't worked with you before. Right. Talking about the micromanaging, you know, and everything with, with Kathleen Kennedy and they've had nothing but director issues with star Wars. Right. They've had some director issues on the Marvel side of things, but they're, they're, you know, with solo, they switch directors literally 75% of the way through the movie. Right. And it shows, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, no, no, trying not to take anything away from Ron Howard. He did the best that he right. could with it. With what he got. But yeah. when you come in and you're handed three quarters of a show and you have to finish the rest of it, there's only so much that you can do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hopefully, uh, they'll pick that back up because I did want to see that. Yeah. Uh, that was it for our, uh, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back with our entertainment news of the week. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. 
each week we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So action news anchor Jim Gardner is going to be dialing back his schedule as he prepares for retirement. So longtime 6ABC WPVI-TV veteran Jim Gardner announced that he'll be dialing back his schedule with Action News and plans to retire at the end of 2022 after more than four decades in broadcasting. So earlier last week, Gardner had informed his colleagues of his decision to reduce his schedule by continuing to anchor the 6 p.m. newscast, but no longer anchoring the 11 o'clock newscast. His last late newscast is scheduled for early January. The network will announce his replacement in the coming months. He said, it's hard to imagine that I have had the opportunity to spend a professional lifetime with colleagues so committed, resourceful, and wonderful. They have taught me so much about television, journalism, and about myself. I am profoundly grateful. He said, I have spent almost my adult life at Action News, and many of our viewers have grown up and experienced life along with me and the on-air team that I work side by side with. I've been blessed to raise a family here, and I have been a member of this community for over 45 years. I feel I have a special relationship with our viewers and the communities we serve, and I plan to continue to enjoy every minute with them over the next year. Gardner has held the long-tenured position of anchor of ABC, of Action News at 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. since May 11th of 1977, after joining WPVI as a reporter and anchor during the noon broadcast in June of 1976. The president and general manager of PVI had shared his thoughts and said, For many of us, Jim is the last news voice we hear before ending our day. He has guided us through the good and with the bad with calm confidence for more than 40 years, often reassuring us that tomorrow will bring a better day. His presence will be missed by our viewers and by all of us at 6ABC. Thankfully, we have another year with him during 6 p.m. the 6 p.m. brought newscast, and we look forward to his continued presence and leadership. Gardner had received his Bachelor's of Arts degree from Columbia University in 1970. And following his graduation, Gardner worked briefly on the radio at the all-news WINS radio in New York and later WFAS radio in White Plains, New York. He began his television broadcast career at K at WKB. W TV in Buffalo before joining WPVI, where he remains, where he has remained for more than four decades. So I had to put this <clears throat> in here because to say that I grew up with Jim Gardner is an understatement. Because <laughs> you did. <laughs> uh, I literally did. You know, yeah. my parents only watched Channel Six. Okay. And from the time that I can remember the first time I ever watched a news broadcast, it was Jim Garner. Mm -hmm. That's the news channel that I watch. Right. Um, and, and again, that's one of those things that just sort of left with, left me, you know, with a fond memories of my sitting down and watching my, with my parents, the okay. news and stuff like that. And, um, the one thing that I, I can certainly say is that. You don't have, like, in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. you know, you had you had these definitive news people on right. network news. Mm -hmm. You know, you went from Walter Winchell to uh, Walter Cronkite. Right. And that's who people trusted. Right. You know, you look to these people during the most pinnacle times of mm -hmm. history. Um, and Jim Garner was that for our area, for the right. Delaware mm -hmm. Valley. Um, 
all these other networks that we have here, the local affiliates have gone through different anchors and, and mm-hmm. different personalities and stuff. And so is Channel 6. Channel 6 has cycled through a lot of people since 1977. Right. No one's been around like Jim Gardner has been around. Mm-hmm. And he's ha- he's developed a rapport with the audience that you can trust him as being impartial. And mm-hmm. that's something to be said in the caustic news environment that we have today that is over-biased, over-saturated with, with political, you know, I don't want to say corruption, but, but political contamination. Mm, okay. Where you can't watch any news network now that doesn't lean one way or the other. Mm-hmm. But every time that Jim Garner comes on the TV, you know you're going to get an impartial, unbiased account of whatever it is that he's reporting mm-hmm. on. Um, and it's a breath of fresh air and it's, it's unfortunate that, that we're losing that in an industry that needs it more now than it ever did before. So he's not retiring yet. He's just dialing it back right right now. So hopefully we'll have another year or so with him before he actually does decide to finally sign off, uh, the air for the last time. But I thought it was significant enough, certainly for our area, to mm-hmm. talk about it. And it was, sure. you know, one of those things that kind of <clears throat> personally hit me, too. Mm-hmm. What else do we have? So it seems that there is a Star Trek theme park section being built right now. The story comes from giantfreakingrobot.com. You put <laughs> ads in, uh, articles in for them just because you like saying that. that. That's why I say it. So obviously in recent years, more theme parks and theme park sections have been opening up. So you had the Avengers Campus section of Disney's California Adventure Park, which opened up this year. Uh, Nintendo also debuted a theme park this year in Japan. Uh, the Super Nintendo World Park is inspired by the company's flagship game franchise, Super Mario Brothers. However, there's another theme park from a big corporation on the horizon. So the Paramount Park is in development and it'll have a Star Trek area. So get ready to boldly go where no theme park person has gone before. In China, though. (laughs) So set to release in China, the Star Trek theme park area will be the perfect destination spot for Paramount and science fiction enthusiasts. The theme park will be in um, Kunming, which is the capital of uh, Yunnan province. Uh, It won't be the only interesting theme park that's in China. The country already has uh, Shanghai Disneyland, Hong Kong Disneyland, and Chime Long Paradise. Although it remains to be seen if the Paramount theme park will be as popular as the rest of these, uh, but it does have the potential to be just as big of an attraction. So according to TrekMovie.com, the park was announced two years ago and more news has now been released. The theme park will also have a resort and it's estimated to be 643 acres. Beyond that, though, it'll have a Star Trek uh, area entitled The Final Frontier. Apart from Star Trek, another brand that'll get its own area in the Paramount Park will be the Peanuts. Uh, The franchise has iconic characters such as Charlie Brown, Lucy, and Snoopy. TrekMovie.com states that other areas included would be a Paramount Boulevard, Adventure City, and Wonderland. So according to Variety, some of the rides and attractions in the area will be based on the Italian Job movie and the Mission Impossible film franchise, which are other Paramount properties. What exactly they'll take from the movies and make into rides... We'll have to just wait and see. However, with Peanuts and Star Trek, fans of the franchise can kind of speculate on what those areas will have. For example, obviously with Peanuts, you're going to have Snoopy walking around. Um, And since he's the most famous character from that franchise. So obviously, maybe they'll have different attractions based on some of their animated specials like The Great Pumpkin or, uh, you know, Charlie Brown and Snoopy, the musical, um, which could be turned into attractions. And then obviously for Star Trek, you're going to probably have some sort of iconic ship uh, in the park. Um, obviously you'll have a plethora of aliens walking around, um, you know, Vulcans and Klingons. So 
who knows what you know each of the areas will will have so variety reports that the theme parks resort will cost 8 billion to make um and it'll be a while before we see it because the estimated uh debut date isn't until 2024 so the the i guess the biggest question that should be asked here at this point is why china is is star trek big in china and i'm not aware of it maybe um well, there are some really cool theme parks in like Dubai also that are there. Well, I think there's a. Uh, and I get that. And I, and I understand why Disney wants a presence in China. It's the mm-hmm. most populous country in the mm-hmm. world. And I think an argument can certainly be made that they can make money off of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know how popular the, the Star Trek franchise is in China. I mean, you kind of need to go where your customers are, right? Right. Well, and the other thing, too, is it's not just a Star Trek theme park. Oh, no, because Peanuts, because I'm sure Peanuts are very popular <laughs> over there, too. It, it's a whole, you know, it's it's Paramount is doing a whole thing together. So, yeah, it does seem kind of, because that's the other thing, too, is, like, with Paramount, they're so all over the place. Right. Like, the Italian job wasn't that like kind of a hit movie to like, you know, mafia hit people like you're going to do a ride like, Ooh, let's, you know, it's almost like a fast and the furious, I guess, you know, or mission impossible. Like, I don't know. I don't see doing a ride like that. I don't know. It just seems like a very odd culmination of things that you're going to mix together to, to do. So some of the obvious complaints that I've seen from, Star Trek, some of the feedback I see from, from Star Trek fans is great. You're you're giving us a theme park that we'll never be able to go to. Mm, true. Which is true, mm-hmm. but you kind of have that with Disney where you have a, you know, a, a hotel that you can never go to because it's too expensive. So it doesn't matter where you put that, right? Right, right. True. <laughs> yeah. Just to kind of flame the 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 fire a little bit with Star War, uh, Star Trek fans in Paramount, uh, Paramount is an, uh, their uh, season three, I think, of Discovery is coming out on Friday. Okay. And they've announced that their Paramount Plus network is only available in the U.S. So people who wanted to get the Paramount shows uh, were able to get most of those on Netflix around okay. the world, Europe and so forth. You can't get those now effective immediately. Mm. So the new season is dropping and you can't get them outside the United States. But Yet, we're going to have. They're putting a theme park. They're going to put a theme park China. there. So someone kind of has someone's to explain. Someone's not planning so well. Yeah, so one side's not talking to the other there. Someone has to explain <laughs> what the logic is there. Oh, goodness. So anyway, that was all we had for our entertainment news. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll take a quick segue, and we'll be right back with our Insightful Picks of the Week. Go for your Insightful Pick. So my Insightful Pick this week is a Netflix limited uh, series um, which uh, just seven episodes, one season, nothing else. Uh, watch it while you can before they you know, take it away. And it is called Midnight Mass. So Midnight Mass sees Riley Flynn, a man haunted by a drunk driving accident, return to his hometown on Crockett Island, where he struggles to find purpose in life. Enter mysterious Father Paul, and what are the intentions that he has? While this charismatic young priest brings glorious miracles, ominous mysteries, and renewed religious fervor to a dying town desperate to believe. It's a very interesting take on, you know, the the classic horror. Um, You have this sleepy town that they talk about. You know, people are getting older. There's not new blood coming in uh, to the town. And, you know, you have some people that are kind of moving away. And all of a sudden, you know, their local priest goes on sabbatical. And now, you you know, he's this 80-year-old priest. And this young 40-year-old priest comes back and kind of revitalizes things. And now everybody seems to have more energy and more joy and what's going on with this. And then you kind of find out that there's a quote unquote 
angel that's helping out with things. And then it kind of turns on its head and <laughs> everything goes up in flames, literally. Um, so it's uh, the uh, the writer of it has done a couple of other horror type uh, shows. So where he had um, ghosts and other things in his other shows, now he's kind of going on a, a different angle. Um, so it's, you know, it's a little slow pace to kind of start, but it definitely, you know, picks up towards the end. I binged it in one day on a day that I had off. Um, you know, so if you're into that genre and you like, uh, you know, it's in, it's also an interesting commentary on religion and, you know, how much faith you have in something. And, and do you put all of your faith in, in one person or do you, you know, kind of let yourself be open uh, to everything? And also about forgiveness and, and, you know, how the consequences of your actions lead you to to where you are. Interesting. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week, I decided to go kind of cheesy on it and uh, picked Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Zhu Shang-Chi is the son of Zhu Wenmu, the founder of the Ten Rings. Since his childhood, Shang-Chi underwent a brutal training regimen that turned him into a formidable martial artist. However, on a mission to avenge his mother's death, he chose to abandon the Ten Rings and leave his family past behind. Seeking to start a new life outside of his father's shadow, Shang-Chi fled to the United States, maintained a peaceful life under the name of Sean with his friend Katie Chen. Eventually, the Ten Rings targeted Shang-Chi once again, so he joined forces with Chen and his sister Zhu Ling in order to oppose Wen Wu in his quest to breach the Dark Gate of Ta Lo, which unleashed the Dweller in Darkness and the Soul Leaders. Unlike with most other Marvel characters, I had little to no exposure to Shang-Chi from the comics myself, so I didn't know much about the original character or backstory, which was kind of refreshing going into the movie. Having come off the relatively formulaic and disappointing show that was Black Widow, my expectations were exceedingly low. The high point of the MCU these days, ironically, isn't the cinema, it's in the serialized stories told on Disney+. I was pleasantly surprised when Shang-Chi surpassed those painfully low expectations. The character seemed more genuine than the typical cookie-cutter character served up in the MCU. There was a general feeling of sympathy, even for the villain, by the end of the movie, something you don't often find encouraged in the typical black-and-white world of the MCU. As expected, the special effects were top-notch. What was a refreshing surprise was the actual fighting. As the main character grew throughout the movie, his fighting style changes to reflect his mindset, which gave the character a truly metamorphic quality. The fight scenes themselves were spectacular. They showcased a plethora of fighting styles in an intricate choreography similar to that of a ballet and were artistically done. We skipped the corny love interest line, which was nice, and saw that people could be motivated by family and friends entirely. It was probably the best MCU film I've seen since Endgame, and I almost feel bad I didn't go see it in the theaters, but I don't think I'm quite there just yet. So my pick this week was Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings on Disney+. Plus. Good pick. And we'll be right back. So I think that is largely all we had for the show this week. Mm -hmm. uh, before we do, do go, uh, you did have a couple of... Afterthoughts, right? Yeah, we have the the two uh, comic cons or and uh, comic con and a comic super toy show um, that are both on the same day. Uh, one is in Ocean City, Maryland, and that is the Ocean City Comic Con, which we will be attending, and that is December eleventh from ten to five p.m. Uh, if you are in the Allentown area of Pennsylvania. There is the Pennsylvania Toy and Comic Super Show also 
on December 11th, and that is from 10 to 2. So it looks like those will probably be the last convention-y type things for the end of the year, but we also have a lot of holiday stuff uh, that's going to be in the area, so we'll probably include that uh, you know, next week, uh, with all the different light shows and, and different things to, to go and see. And I'll do some research and find some of the other ones in the area. So we're not just talking about our area. So for anybody, you know, listening where they nice. can, where they can go and find everything. That would be nice. Before we do go, I want to once again, invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. Audio versions of this podcast can be found listed as insights into entertainment Video versions of all podcasts can be listed as insights into things, and you can find them anywhere you can get a podcast, Apple, Spotify, etc. Stitcher twice. Stitcher and Stitcher. Uh, sounds like a law firm. Yeah. <laughs> um, we would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback, give us your shows. Uh, we would love to, to showcase any things that you have in your area there. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com backslash insights underscore things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Facebook when I decide to post something there at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. Audio versions of this podcast can be found on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find us on Instagram also whenever I post things on instagram.com backslash insights into things. Video versions of the podcast can also be found at podcast.insightsintothings.com. And for video version, uh, nope, you did the video versions, didn't you? Uh, I didn't do YouTube. YouTube, that's it. <laughs> if you, I, I knew there was a video thing somewhere around. So if you find us on YouTube uh, for all of our videos, it is youtube.com backslash insights into things. Or you can get links to all that on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And that is it. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.